Hello, and welcome to Nailing It Down, a VARM blog production. And today we're talking about the many theories of class that we often encounter. And while Marx may be the primary class analysis of capitalism and one that kind of haunts uh, most academic analysis, whether it's used or not, as a capstone of the class analysis of both French and British liberal politics, as well as British political economy, this brings us to the other primary thinker of the early 20th century on class, Max Weber. Now, Max Weber is a complicated figure, born in 1864, so he overlapped with Marx, but not in any time in which you could have really known him. And he died in 1920. Um, he is influential on both liberal and conservative thinkers, Talcott Parsons, the centrist Raymond Aron, and even Ludwig von Mises, the arch-conservative paleo-libertarian thinker, were influenced by him. But so was Gregory Lukács, most of the Frankfurt School and C. Wright Mills, who will come up later. What we have with Weber is a complicated situation. He is mostly remembered as one of the three founders of sociologist, of sociology as a field, and the other two founders are generally considered the conservative thinker Emil Durkheim and, of course, Karl Marx. But he was also a historian, a legal thinker or jurist, and a proper political economist himself. And his thinking is more influential on later thinkers who are used by liberals, so it can't really be ignored. Another thing we have to deal with is Weber's political affiliations, which shifted greatly throughout his life. In the 1820s, he enrolled at the University of Heidelberg as a law student. He transferred to Friedrich Wilhelm University, which is today Humboldt University of Berlin, and then to the University of Gottlingen. He worked as a junior lawyer and a lecturer simultaneously. And he passed the referendar are the bar in 1886. He continued to study law and history, became more interested in political economy. And his dissertation in 1889 was on the development of the principle of joint liability and of separate fund of general partnership of the household and communities and commercial organizations and Italian cities. Now dry as that may be, one can see in that long title that the kinds of things that, say, Marxists would be concerned with were also being dealt with in earnest in Weber's work. This eventually led to a longer work on the history of the commercial partnerships in the Middle Ages based on the Southern European documents, which was published also in 1889. Weber was a much more successful academician than Marx. He married his distant cousin, Marianne Schn uh, Schnittniger, um, who was a feminist activist in 1893 and had no children. As he was finishing his doctorate, Weber became interested in social policy. And in fact, he joined the Society for Social Politics, which was filled with German economists affiliated with the, quote, historical school. The historical school is different from historical materialism, although it seems to rhyme with it. In its later days, it is, late, it is related to um, people like Werner Sombart and Weber himself, 
in its earlier days, it was related to people like George Friedrich Knapp, um, who was one of the founders of chartalism, um, Karl Buckner, who was a big proponent of non-market economics, but by this we don't mean communist or socialist, non-market economics, but prior economic modes. Adolf Wagner, who was a leading academic socialist and a German economist in the late 19th century. During this time period, Weber was part of the Pan-German League. Um, the Pan-German League was a movement for German colonial expansion, for the Germanization of Poles, um, which was a position that Weber, for example, advocated, and for the foundation of something like a, a German imperial response to the imperial powers. Um, so Pan, the Pan-German League was also interested in, for example, the incorporation of the Anschluss and the annexation of the Sudetenlands um, before the Nazis took those up. But... But by 1900, Weber became interested in social democracy as it existed under the auspices of Karl Kowski, a member of the SPD, um, particularly after he resigned his professorship in 1903 and became an associate editor of the Archives for Social Science and Social Welfare. A group that was similar to things like the Frankfurt School. During this time period, he became a full member of the SPD. Um, although he was on the right wing of the SPD's flank. So early on, he actually supported the nationalist rhetoric and the war effort with some hesitation, even against Kowski's people. Viewing war as a necessity to fulfill Germany's duty as a leading state power and thus provide for socialism. So even when he was in the SPD, he was no Marxist, and that needs to be taken into account. However, during the war... Weber changed positions. He became a critic of German expansionism and the Kaiser's war policies. He publicly attacked the Belgian annexation policy and unrestricted use of submarine warfare during World War I. He called for constitutional reforms, democratization, and universal suffrage. After World War II, particularly after Weber joined the Worker and, uh, and Soldier Council of Heidelberg and in the German Revolution of 1918, he worked with the Paris Peace Conference and the Confidential Committee for Constitutional Reform and was one of the members in drafting the Weimar Constitution. More controversially, he defended the provisions for emergency powers in Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, those very powers that enabled Adolf Hitler to subvert the rest of the Constitution and institute rule by decree. Weber became a member of the liberal German Democratic Party, which he was a co-founder, breaking with his prior social democratic right inclinations. Weber critiqued the left. He complained about the leaders of the Spartacus League in particular, including Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, that controlled the city of Berlin while Weber was campaigning 
for the German Democratic Party. We do not know where he would have sided in post-Weimar debates because he dies of Spanish flu in his early 50s in 1920. Now, he is most famous for the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism. People often have to deal with that book on the left and don't realize that it is a subtle critique of Marxist occupations. For example, in the Marxist way of thinking, the church domination of social life in the Middle Ages is a form of social reproduction which manifests in the feudal or arm manorial, feudal is what Marx would have used, manorial is more common now, mode of production of the Middle Ages. Weber thinks Marx's mode of production analysis is too simple. And in the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, he argues that the aesthetic, the as the aesthetic, not aesthetic, that although that can count too, the aesthetic nature of Protestantism with elective affinities was part of what led to market-driven capitalism and the rational legal systems in Western Europe. Protestant ethic was only one of the broader considerations of the world's religions. Weber later examined the religions of China, India, as well as ancient Judaism in regards to their differing economic consequences and the conditions of the religious notions of social stratification. This led him to categorize social authority into three distinct forms, the charismatic, the traditional, and the rational legal. Weber also analyzed bureaucracy that modern institutions were increasingly based on in rational legal authority. This is important in the Frankfurt School. So you hear about instrumental reason. Now, that doesn't explain Weber's theory of class, and so we're going to have to take on Weber's view of, of social stratification or social class. And where he differs from Marx, where Marx thinks the primary locus of class is in social reproduction, in the relations of production and the modes of production, and then all the superstructural artifices that reinforce that from ideology to religion to elements of culture that aren't directly about relations of production to elements of the law. Weber thought that you had to look at this in three different ways. That class is one economics position based on an individual's birth and individual achievement. So class for Weber includes your class origins and your current role in production. He also thought your status which is your social prestige or honor, may or may not influence your class position, but was itself another form of social stratification. So different statuses exist within the same class and between them. And this leads to things like Badu's theory of social distinction and symbolic violence, etc. And then lastly, pure power are the ability to get one's way despite the resistance of others generally through violence, and violence here being literal, not metaphorical. In another major work Weber wrote, The Politics as Vocation, Weber defined the state as an entity which claimed a monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory, i.e. the state has a monopoly on explicit violence. Not necessarily on implicit violence. And state power was often subservient to, but separate from, other social modes of reproduction. So, for example, in Weber, it makes sense to talk about a political class separate from the bourgeoisie, who aren't just subor subordinate to it. And Marx, Marx would see the, the political class, our politicians, as subordinate to the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm 
but empowered to manage their disagreements and to empower them to suppress other elements of society. Now, if the monopoly on violence sounds similar from libertarianism, this is because Ludwig von Mises actually picked this up in his writings on the economic calculation and socialist commonwealth. This is all quite dry, but this is why Weber and later people like C. Wright Mills and the power elite see po politicians as a separate base of power from the economic, whereas Marxists see them as emerging from the economic power base. We can also see that Weber defines class in a way that really does deal with more nodes of power, but is not primarily or even clearly always concerned, even in terms of economic class, with your relationship and the production of the ec economic basis of society. Weber also develops theories about opportunity capture and bureaucratization, which he often <laughs> seems to have experienced in his dealings with politics that are often considered important for later thinkers. Furthermore, um, Weber's class analysis is far more complicated than Marx's. Weber saw himself as developing Marx's categories. He didn't see himself as totally rejecting them although he ends up on the liberal side of things and was always, even when he was a social democrat, a German nationalist. Weber was interested in like the power of the aristocracy could still wield even after the bourgeois revolutions, despite the fact they lacked economic wealth, but had strong political power. Thus, he saw this as a refutation of part of Marx's theories that the stratification was based more on on the ownership of capital. Now, asterisk. I think this is a misunderstanding of what Marx is saying, because Marx does see these kind of social divisions, at, even ones that are legally instituted and may be weak in a future society, as still being part of the overall social reproduction unit. But that's not how... Marx was being read at the time, particularly my more and vulgar Marxists in the SP day. Weber thought that he was deriving his account of the social stratification on the more complex social relations of Germany at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. Weber also looked at the fact that, that wealthy families were also stratified themselves amongst access to prestige or status and access to power, i.e. guns, and that one could have wealth and prestige or wealth and power or wealth and neither prestige or power. And in fact, this could also be seen in intra-class relations, that there are stratifications of subclasses and strata within the groups. Now, there have been theorists who've tried to make this more copacetic with Marxism. That what Weber is describing is the more lived experience of class and class stratification and other things like what's later called class habitus are like your the habits you developed being raised in a certain class, uh, the cultural hegemony of other classes, which is something picked up on by Gramsci. Uh, these things are all seen as being part of Weber's class matrix, and thus someone like Eric Olin Wright, who I'll get to way later in this series, tries to square the circle saying the Marxist dynamic is the primary dynamic of capitalism, and thus ex exp explaining of the, of the driver of capital. But the secondary dynamics are explained more clearly by Weber. Now, I am somewhat sympathetic to this, except that I think that takes both a vulgar reading of Marx and a softening of the claims of Weber. Uh, 
after all, class as defined by birth is often understood in Marxist terms now as caste. And again, I've pointed out in my video on Marx, this is not the way Marxists are up to Lenin would have talked about this, but it is a common distinction today. Whereas someone like uh, Pierre Bourdieu in French sociology, who I will also get to later in this series, would say that your role in production is primary, but your habitus and your ability to gain distinction overlaps with that, but is somewhat separate from it. And thus, you're talking about two separate things when you're talking about classes. And this leads to a lot of confusion in today's Marxists who often go back and forth between a Marxist conception of class and a Vivian or liberal conception of class. And I'll talk about, you know, why the Vivian is so influential to the liberal ones when we get more towards liberal sociologists. Without really acknowledging that they switch between one criterion and another. All right. I think a lot of modern Marxists like myself don't deny a lot of big, uh, Weber's um, descriptions and will say that it's not just the vulgar mold of production, but also relations of production, which are not just defined by... Um, pure economic modes, but often in societies before capitalism, economic modes and legal modes are not separated. They barely are in capitalism either, but they are more, they're more implicated in uh, relations of who controls the currency. These are things to consider when you hear people talk about class. Are they talking about the Marxist view of class? Are they using some version of Weber or are they mixing the two? And while the two may be able to be mixed, it is true that elements of Weber are incompatible with Marx, and this needs to be understood. It does not necessarily mean that one is right or wrong, you know, just because of newer or whatever. I tend to think that Marx's description of the primary dynamics of capital stand, but it is insufficient to explain the way most people experience class relations in their daily life. That's the mystification of capital, and we can use sociology to dive into that mystification. And I think Weber's work is, illum is illuminating here, but I think there's normative assumptions in Weber's work that aren't realized. And I think while he is using a more multi-causal dynamic, he is not really trying to weigh which one is more important than the other, and that might be important to do. Now I'm going to list uh, the works I used to cite and maybe something that can help you understand this, a brief summary, in the show notes. Like and subscribe, hit the bell, uh, listen to the podcast, and remember there's a Patreon if you're interested, but I always welcome free engagement and share this to people who want to know more. This one's a little more, more dry but you're going to need it to understand the base of other thinkers in the future because Weber is so important to later sociological distinctions about class. Mm -hmm.